Welcome back, everyone. Um, and now we um, are in the um, uh, third session um, of the symposium, and we um, move to large themes, um, empire and uh, revolution. Um, and we're going to look at civility, enlightenment, cross-cultural uh, transfer. So um, uh, Wei Zhuang will build on uh, the paper of Iris Moon uh, earlier um, today. Our first speaker is Max Bryant, um, who is a postdoctoral fellow at the Centre for the Study of Classical uh, Architecture um, at the University of Cambridge. He is one of three postdoctoral uh, fellows. I think Rebecca Gill may also be uh, here today. Um, his research addresses Charles Robert uh, Cockrell, um, on whom he will curate an exhibition at the Soane Museum in 2026. And as noted earlier by Frank, uh, Max is the architect of this symposium, and he will speak today on civility, civilization, and the civil architecture of Sir William Chambers. Max. Thank you, Christine. It's been such a pleasure to be hearing all these papers so far. I can't tell you um, how much fun I'm having. So um, I hope you will tolerate my own contribution to today. The theme of progress feels so fundamental that it is, a, it is as if it has always been with us. In the West, however, progress considered in social and political terms is a relatively new notion. Writers and thinkers only really became self-conscious about progress in the middle decades of the 18th century. Until then, the word civility connoted a timeless idea of a well-managed society. But in Britain in the end of the 1750s, a new word, civilization, began to take its place. And this rise can be traced in their relative uses in English publications. Civilization implied a development over time, a social, political, and cultural progress. In particular, civilization began to be understood as a pro progression through particular stages, defined in terms of the means of subsistence. This formula was popularized by Adam Smith as four stages, taking mankind from hunting to shepherding to agriculture and finally to commerce. William Chambers' masterpiece, Somerset House, has been associated with this concept of the stadial progress of civilization in its accommodation of multiple institutions. As we've heard, Chambers housed the Royal Academy with its school of painting, as well as the Royal Society. The latter, its president, Joseph Banks, was fascinated by global plant transfer between the colonies. The historian Edward Gibbon must have been thinking of this conjunction of activities when he wrote that King George III, adapting his benefactions to the different stages of society, has founded a school of painting in his capital and has introduced into the islands of the South Sea the vegetables and animals most useful to human life. The North Wing, housing the academy and society, had opened the same year that Gibbon wrote these words. Chambers' treatise on civil architecture was published in London in 1759, just at the point when civilization and the stadial model of progress were beginning their rise to ubiquity. Civil, in the title, distinguished the architecture discussed from naval and military architecture. But Chambers must have known of the associations of the term when he began with a preface rewriting Vitruvius to retell the rise of architecture alongside that of commerce. And we've been thinking this morning about the idea of Chambers as a merchant and the important impact this had on his, his thoughts, and I think this is, a, this is an example of that. Rather than a revivalist attempt to return to the first principles of classicism, Chambers makes clear throughout that the long historical process of perfecting classical architecture did not end in the ancient world. We can see Chambers' new awareness, particularly in his divergence from his sources, including his teacher, Blondel. One of these is his representation of the classical orders, rearranging their sequence into a progress from low to high status, but also scaling them all to the same size. As he wrote, this was to emphasize the increase of refinement rather than that of scale and grandeur. The progress that Chambers was interested in representing was a qualitative one. There are many theories of progress that Chambers may have read in French, those of Quenet and Helvetius, and in English, those of Ferguson and Adam Smith. 
Chambers doesn't mention any by name, but I'd like to propose a source for the treatise that he certainly did know, and that seems to be a missing link between various thoughts and positions that he held throughout his career. Antoine-Yves Goguet was a conseiller to the Parliament of Paris and contributor to the Journal des Savantes. To l'origine des lois, des arts et des sciences was, according to Gibbon, not well known in Britain. Among those who did have copies, however, were William Chambers, as well as his pupil, the Prince of Wales, later King George III. We can claim this because it was represented in their libraries in the second edition of 1759, despite being republished many times across the rest of the century. Gauguin's stadial theory of the progress of civilization was a two-stage one, in which agriculture leads to the establishment of cities. And cities ruled by kings are the drivers of commerce and culture. Gauguin ties his theory to a bizarre post-Diluvian biblical chronology, beginning with the fall of the Tower of Babel as the first city. So I've read this book, so you don't have to, but a few particulars, <laughs> cl particular claims are ones that characterize the writings of Chambers. First, contemporary China is treated as an exemplary model of civilized society. According to Gauguin, after the confusion of tongues, China was one of three original urbanized societies alongside Chaldea and Egypt. Other theorists of progress, like Smith and Ferguson, had a much lower opinion of China. Secondly, the exceptional status of ancient Greece is consistently undermined. Gauguin's thesis about the Greeks is that they were civilized through colonization from Egypt. For Smith, the ancient Greek polis was categorically different from Nineveh or Memphis. Thirdly, Gauguin emphasizes the word civil, capitalizing all the letters of the word and using it to encompass everything that is culturally specific to a particular society. Finally, and most importantly, Gauguin is the theorist of progress who reconciles it with absolute monarchy. In Gauguin's account, the peoples that Europeans encountered as they overran the globe in the 18th century represented not Lockean citizens of nature, still less the unevolved figures of 19th century pseudoscience, but rather examples of cultural decadence in failing to establish monarchical urban societies like those of Europe and China. They had gradually lost their pre-Diluvian wisdom. Revolution against absolute monarchy represents a reversal of the progress of civilization. Reading works such as this in the 1750s, Chambers would have been positioned to be one of the first major architects to be self-conscious about this new idea of historicized civilization. What might the repercussions be for our sense of his work as an architect? I'd like to look specifically at one of his major projects. Gore House was built on Whitehall in London and completed in 1774. The work had been underway for nearly a decade. It was built for the second Earl Gore, later Marquess of Stafford, Granville Lucen Gore, spelled as you can see here, Laverson Gower, with the chaotic pronunciation of English pronounced Lucen Gore, which is rather an evocative phrase, the idea of the, the loosening of gore. Um, it's not much to look at from the facade facing Whitehall, but if we go round to the other side and into the entrance, after passing through an anteroom, we encounter one of the most spectacular spaces in 18th century London. We're invited to pass under the Doric screen up a single flight that then cantilevers out in two directions and returns us to see the full scale of the space. As we rise to an ionic balcony, more arches send the eye upwards to a further balcony and a huge domed skylight. Passing through the main rooms of the principal story, we reach this remarkable space, the Great Drawing Room comprising the full length of the house's east front. Most effectively of all, we encounter the Corinthian order at last, and in a, massive, at a, in, a, in a powerful assertion, our first straight entablature in this massive edicule. Giving further depth is the huge commode-shaped table now on display in the Courtauld Gallery. Lord Gore was one of the most reliable supporters of King George III, and the house abounds with monarchical iconography, climaxing with the chimney piece in this room, now in the Victoria and Albert Museum, carved with a medallion of the king's head, with fasces on the supports. The fasces were a motif in various parts of the house. We've seen the fasces already on the, um, the uh, coach uh, held by one of those tritons. Inclu and they also appear on the remarkable legs of the two commode-shaped tables. And I'll leave um, the discussion of the, the sources for that to, to Lars and others from this morning. In 1783, the House of Commons attempted to regulate the work of the East India Company, 
diminishing private monarchical involvement in Indian affairs. And it was in this room that the plot to undermine this attempt was hatched by the king's supporters. The success of this plot has been described as a bloodless monarchical coup by George III, comparable to that achieved by Gustavus III a decade earlier here in Sweden. So what about the Gore House project might register these new ideas of civilization? The first th feature that I would like to point to is its circulation, the way that a visitor would have moved through the house. I'm not suggesting that Chambers was literally saying, to, trying to create a symbolic progress of civilization, but rather that we see him inviting us to reflect on our own progress through the spaces in a way that is directly analogous. The staircase at Gore House takes the essential form of the San Jorge Maggiore staircase with the single flight, flight branching out, but extends it up. He separates the flow up to the further story into a different staircase, so it's not clear how we reach that upper balcony. All this is clearly articulated with the distinction of the balusters, with those in iron on the staircase and the stone in the middle and above, inviting a point of reflection on the previous and forthcoming stages of the process. The separation of circulation in a single space goes back to one of Chambers' earliest major designs, one for the Duke of York. Here the two colors show two paths of circulation, with Chambers presenting a staircase with balconies alongside, which are accessed from a separate room. Complex staircases feature in the work of other British architects like William Kent, Robert Adam, we've seen Wyatt's staircase at Buckingham House today. But the movement is always continuous rather than being broken up into stages like Chambers attempted here. Another example of what we might call stadial circulation is the Hyde, where Chambers was commissioned to add a sculpture gallery and a staircase. Ingeniously, he made the latter a feature of the former by producing a balcony overlooking the gallery and again, he concealed the point of connection. At each distinct stage in these routes, Chambers invites us to reflect and anticipate different parts of a space. At Gore House, the sense of reflection is continued in the great drawing room. <coughs> Opposite the doors of access, on what was clearly an exterior wall as it had windows, Chambers placed fake false doors, repeating the form of the door that one entered, but filled with mirrors. One would have seen an exact reproduction of oneself entering the room. Gore House is therefore a particularly good example of what we might think of as a distinctively Chambersian approach to circulation, where we're invited to reflect on our own movement. Lying behind this may be the self-conscious citizen of commercial modernity, situating themselves in terms of a narrative of social progress towards commerce. The second feature that I would like to identify is the way that Chambers registers the history of architecture in the decorative language of Gore House. By making direct reference to canonical precedent, Chambers implies a progress of architecture with his work directly improving an existing model. For this, the house was perfectly located with perhaps the single most important example of British architectural classicism right next door. The banqueting house was built for King James I by the architect Inigo Jones. Jones was the first English architect to be working with first-hand experience of Palladio's example. No building was more canonical for the British architectural imagination before and after Chambers' time. For Chambers, however, Banqueting House was not the unimpeachable standard it had been for previous generations. In particular, in the treatise, Chambers singled out Jones' capitals. The ovolo of the Ionic forces the volutes into an enormous projection, which is, quote, unusually defective and exceedingly ugly. Jones's composites, meanwhile, are wider at their lower edges than the top of the shafts below them. This feature is hard to see from a distance, but noticeable on the corner pilasters. The result is that it looks a little like a large capital is unsteadily perched on top of the shaft. Of this, Chambers writes, quote, nothing can be uglier. All of Chambers' work is, of course, a demonstration of his refinement of the classical language of decoration. But Gorehouse particularly emphasizes a visitor's close encounter inside with the capitals, with the Corinthian edicules of the great drawing room having no parallel in his other work. But the idea that Chambers was thinking specifically about Jones's capitals is made more convincing by his creation of a viewing platform for them. After the staircase, but before the great drawing room, we enter this strange room with three windows, only one of which was actually glazed. That one, the one on the right, gives a perfect view of the banqueting house's composite and ionic capitals. We may be invited in this way to follow Gauguet 
in reading historical development in terms of material survivals, drawing visual comparisons, and identifying refinement, progress, and civilization. The resonances go deeper than the visual. For Jones's banqueting house was not just an architectural landmark, but a political one as well. It was here in January 1649 that King Charles I, the son of King James, was beheaded on the orders of Oliver Cromwell and the Puritan Commonwealth. The British monarchy of the 18th century was haunted by this foundational trauma, this loosening of gore. You can look out for it on the 3rd of May, as after the coronation of Charles III, the gold state coach returns from Westminster Abbey up Whitehall to Buckingham Palace. William Chambers' architectural response, however, is no more. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Max. I'd give my eye teeth to be on that, looking out that window at the level of the, of the banqueting uh, house. Um, our next speaker is um, Felix Martin, um, who is an architect, um, a research assistant in architectural history, and a teacher in the Department of Architecture at Aachen University in Germany and has recently completed a PhD thesis on the casino at Marino, um, designed by William Chambers for um, James Caulfield, first Earl of Charlemont. His paper is entitled Chambers in Dublin, a distinct architectural approach for the second city of the empire. Felix. Well, uh, thank you very much, Christine, and uh, thank you for having me here. Um, I'm truly honored to participate in this celebration of uh, William Chambers' anniversary, especially since I have um, did the PhD on the Casino at Marino, and now I'm super excited to meet all those names I had on the covers of my books, which I used during uh, my doctoral studies. So this is quite an honor. And as for today's talk, I've decided uh, to not, not only to talk about the casino, but also to take a look at uh, William Chambers' other work in Ireland. Um, because I would like to argue that it was in the Irish capital and not in England uh, that Chambers came much closer to his idea uh, of conceiving the exterior of any building as a, private as a public monument, whether it housed a public institution or was privately owned. And what that means, we are going to try to explain you really quickly with a couple of slides. So, but I first like to recall this uh, discrepancy between, or this often stated discrepancy between um, Chambers' socialization amidst the epicenter of neoclassicism in Rome in the 1750s and the rather restrained designs he then thereafter produced for his English clients, um, which um, induced scholars to, to, um, to describe him as a late Palladian architect. And um, if we look at his writings, and especially as his, at his unrealized designs, we see that um, these designs are, are characterized by spatially layered exteriors with an often monumental articulation, um, with sepulchral iconography, inventive applications of ancient building motifs, and a bewildering incongruity between external articulation and internal function. So these characteristics, which are truly neoclassical, are all absent from his most um, sort of well-known realized projects of his earlier years. Um, so they are absent from Woodstock Town Hall, uh, Duddingston House, uh, Roehampton House, and Melbourne House. And I'm particularly foking, focusing within this 15 minutes on the exteriors of these buildings. Um, so this early style of Chambers was, or this maybe the style which was more dear to his heart was rejected in England, and I would like to argue that he was, at least to a certain extent, able to realize it in uh, Dublin. And uh, this is surprising because, uh, because um, he arguably never set foot to Ireland, uh, in Ireland. And um, this is surpri even more surprising when you uh, look at this map of Dublin and realize that Dublin is the second city, uh, the city with the second most projects of chambers within one city. And um, the four or five most prominent buildings that are still uh, in Dublin by Chambers are, of course, the Casino at Marino, Charlemagne House, Lucan House, and the Chapel and Examination Hall uh, at Trinity. And we're going to look at it in the other way around. So we begin, we begin with Trinity. Well, first of all, we, we look at his design drawings he uh, delivered for these Irish projects, and we can already s sense 
an attempt by Chambers that he tried to introduce this rejected neoclassical language to Ireland. Because when we look at his, his design drawings, we see the casino sarcophagus like attic, the chimney stacks disguised as altars at Roxborough and Trinity, and the urn-topped attics and steeples all document Seamus' intention to realize his understanding of architecture as a producer of public monuments in Ireland. And in fact, to a certain extent, he did succeed in introducing this language to Dublin. Uh, we begin with the most obvious one, the, um, a, a truly public building, uh, Trinity College, um, which he was, for which he was to, uh, asked to design uh, a theater and examination hall in in 1775, and in, a, in an axiometric view from 1780, we already see that the uh, theatre was already uh, finished and was to be mirrored by the same design on the other side of front, Trinity's front court um, by a chapel. He, was, he also designed a steeple, um, which was supposed to replace an older one, um, and for this occasion he just recycled a, a design with, which was... Um, which failed in Britain for the steeple in Trinity. So this is the design for St. Marylebone Church. And with the chapel, which was in the end um, built in a rather stripped-down version, um, we can still sense this sort of predilection of boldness in architecture with these heavily rusticated arches and windows providing a dark backdrop for the unfluted bright uh, Corinthian columns. And the design nevertheless included many more details which would have um, turned this chapel building into a more um, cl neoclassical uh, design with attic statuary, with these um, Roman altars on top of the roof and uh, the do little dome with those urns around it. And I took the liberty to, to digitally add those domes to, uh, to Trinity's front court, so, and just to, just to be able to compare it with this uh, other public building in Britain, where he as well uh, structured a square-like front yard uh, or courtyard uh, with porticos and small domes on top around, all around the three sides. Um, I haven't looked into the chronolo chronology of both uh, designs, so I might do this for the paper to learn more about which, uh, which project came first. Um, but now let us look at his private, um, private designs, because it's really interesting to see that he attempted to pull the exterior of even of private houses into the public sphere. And um, he did this, in, for instance, with Lucan House um, from the, in the early 1770s, where he eliminated the traditional, the centuries old traditional function of the portico as a sign uh, for the, the owner's dignitas and, or taste in the 18th century and pushed it up one level, uh, whereas the piano nobili of the Lucan House remains on ground floor. And this is, of course, a little bit surprising, but first he again recycled this idea from two other projects which weren't realized, one in Sweden, in fact, Svazio Palace, and uh, of course, Herwood House, which he already saw today. And if you look into the letters, Chambers and uh, the owner of the house, Akmondish and Vese, wrote to each other, um, you stumble across a comment by uh, Vese who said, um, that he wants the portico to be very visible from the river. And the river was already sort of public grounds, grounds you can see it from this uh, etching here. And especially if you consider uh, his, the vicinity of the house to the river Liffey, you, re you can also imagine how it would have looked, um, how the house would have appeared much more stately when you were on boat. So um, in this way, Chambers succeeded in pulling the exterior of Lucan House into the public sphere designing it for the eye of the public rather than for its owner alone. And this becomes even more clear if you look at Lord Charlemagne's two buildings, uh, which are still there in Dublin today. First of all, um, Charlemagne House on Rutland Square, which is now Parnell Square. <coughs> and here it, was, it becomes even more evident how Chambers convinced his clients to bring the exterior into the public sphere because he argued with Chambers, or he convinced Cham uh, sorry, Chambers convinced Charlemagne that the house should, be, should stand as close to the street as possible. And to understand this remark, or the extent of this remark, let us briefly recall how, um, how townhouses were built, or grand townhouses were built in the previous decades on, in Piccadilly or Kildare Street in Dublin. Uh, they all were hidden and removed from, this, from the public and hidden by a tall wall and uh, closed gates and so on and so forth. 
And Shamans himself had to do the same, use the same typology when he built in, uh, in London. And uh, he literally criticized this typology he himself had to um, uh, comply with uh, in his treaties um, because he wanted to have those public, uh, those, sorry, those private townhouses become part of the city and become an ornament to the city. And in this way, um, not only was the exterior of Charlemagne House integrated into the uh, Dublin cityscape, but a public stage was also created for Charlemagne, uh, Charlemagne's hospitality as the reception of guests was now part of the public sphere and no longer hidden behind locked gates and high walls. Although Charlemagne House, Lucan House and Trinity buildings with their magnificence evoking monumental vocabulary and the boldness and character already embody Chambers' architectural idea um, to a larger extent than his British commissions prior to Somerset House. It is, enough, uh, it is through his smallest commission island uh, that Chambers was able to fully explore the idea of architecture as a producer of public monuments. And again, this is a private building. Um, and I'm obviously talking about uh, talking about the casino at Marino, which was part of a Marino garden, uh, Lord Charlemagne's landscape garden, just outside of, of Dublin. And um, yet, although it was a sort of a temple in the garden, it defies any classification as a garden temple. It was a fact, in fact, a villa housed inside this temple-like exterior. And if we look at the history of this small design, um, we can see that Charlemagne, in fact, wanted to have both a, a monument forest garden and a private villa. And Seamus convinced him to merge both projects into one and designed a peculiar um, single-story monument um, with this Greek cross plan encircled by um, Doric columns and housed a, 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 a modest but uh, still extend um, a private villa inside of it, which was fully capable to house um, a small household of, of, of the 18th century. And this happened on three floors and over 40 rooms, and that, that was all wrapped into one single-story monument from the outside. And uh, as we can see, um, the, um, the result is a unique and fascinating uh, design with a, with a fascinating spatial complexity. And Chambers literally separated the exterior from the interior um, to be able to apply or to be able to act more freely on the exterior and design sort of another building which wasn't fettered by the uh, function of representing what's happening inside. And so he was able to apply his monumental vocabulary he developed just a couple of years earlier in, uh, during his time at Rome and together with his French uh, student fellows and seeking a new language for the emerging public institutions in their native countries, Chambers and his fellow sh French students had explored a monumental language and typologies of public buildings in the shadow of the ruins of great Roman public structures. So those young architects thought to revive a more austere language enriched by Roman sacrificial and funerary iconography that was to articulate any building in the public sphere as a lasting monument. And if you look at the sort of uh, the language they used, um, uh, the vocabulary consists of corner statuary, smoke emitting vessels, sarcophagus like motifs, uh, festoons and uh, urns, uh, bold rustications, of course, the Doric order. And such exteriors um, aim to evoke ancient monumentality, uh, regardless of their size and the functions they housed. And this is backed up by um, a philosopher, Chambers had in his library, Alexander Girard, who in his essay of taste at around the same time, argued that, it didn't, that an object didn't need to be really large to become monumental, but that it was already enough to associate the idea of monumentality with the object for the object to become monumental itself. So I would like to argue that these architects, or chambers at least, um, made use of, use of this idea that the casino didn't have to be very large um, for it to be still uh, still to be monumental. And with the vocabulary Chambers had picked up in Rome, um, it evokes ancient monumentality, monumentality and not the existence of a private dwelling inside of it. More than that, the casino with its windowless facade and funerary iconography strongly recalls the appearance of mausoleum 
a characterization that Chambers and Charlemagne may have welcomed, as its design alludes to the prototype of a freestanding public monument in the history of architecture, the Mausoleum of Halicarnassus. And I just briefly mention this because there's not, not too much time left, but um, the casino is in fact um, similar in plan and elevation to early modern attempts to reconstruct the Mausoleum of Halicarnassus, which Charlemagne during his travels um, relocated in Bodrum. And in fact, Chambers included um, dimin dimensions of the mausoleum into the plan and elevation of the casino. And this sort of backs up the idea of the casino's exterior being a monument rather than a villa. But how uh, can the casino become a public monument? Uh, it is situated in a private garden, but Charlemagne allowed, access, pu allowed the public access to his garden and was placed in alignment with North Strand Road so that you could see it when you leave Dublin in the 18th century in the northeast direction. As with the casino, Chambers sought to enhance the magnificence of Dublin in his Irish projects by tailoring their designs towards the public gaze, thus pulling the exterior into the public sphere. The exteriors were then meant to appeal to the emotions of their beholders, evoking a similar enthusiasm for the virtues and spirit of enlightened Ireland and Britain, just as the remains of ancient Greece and Rome evoked rhapsodic adoration for their public magnificence in views of the Parthenon and Forum Romanum. Eventually, Dublin's rapid urban growth and the need for newly constructed public buildings, as well as the personal inclina inclination of some of his Anglo-Irish clients, towards Chambers' ideas appear to have provided a suitable framework in which he was able to pursue his architectural idea of creating public monuments on both private and public ground at a much earlier date than in England. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Felix. Um, we will now have um, Yue Zhuang, um, who is a senior lecturer in Chinese art history and visual culture at the University of Exeter in Devon. Um, Yue is an architect and holds not one but two PhDs, one from her native China and the second from Edinburgh. Her research focuses on cross-cultural contacts between China and Europe in the early modern period with emphasis on landscape and her work is strongly cross-disciplinary in character. Her paper, paper is entitled um, William Chambers, um, Shaping the Virtues of Empire, William Chambers' Dissertation on Oriental Gardening. Thank you. One of the most intriguing aspects of Sir William Chambers' career is his association with Chinese gardens. In the 1740s, when he traveled to China with the Swedish East India Company, the craze for Xinhua Three and the Chinese gardens was much in the air. The idea of a Chinese garden with its irregular appearance, exalting a greater beauty, propagated by Sir William Temple, had already been circulating in England for about half a century structures that imitated an imagined Chinese style had made their appearances on rich landowners' estates like Stowe and Studley Royal. Chambers' rare first-hand knowledge of Ch Chinese buildings and gardens, as John Harris has shown, facilitated his links with Frederick Prince of Wales and Lord Butte who possibly commissioned his design of the House of Confucius um, at Kew Gardens, installed by 1749. Chambers also authored designs for Chinese buildings, uh, which I've heard, we, we have heard from Iris' uh, presentation this morning, which includes the influential essay of the art of laying out gardens among the Chinese. Based on this essay, Chambers developed his controversial dissertation on oriental gardening in 1772. Claiming a success in continental Europe, the dissertation in England was widely thought to be Chambers' personal protest against his rival, Lancelot Capability Brown's naturalistic landscape gardening. So that is um, Chambers and Brown. 
The call of Chinese gardens, chambers asserted, consists of three scenes, the pleasing, the terrible, and the surprising. We may get a taste of scenes of the pleasing from the following. The, this is a quotation from the dissertation Oriental Gardening. The plentiful waterworks, the rich plantations, the exotic animals and the birds, the sophisticated tree-lined walks, the cabinets of verdure and the grottoes adorned with incrustations of coral shells, oils, gems, and crystallizations, the elegant pavilions with sophisticated names, the splendid and spacious buildings furnished with pictures, sculptures, embroideries, trinkets, and pieces of clockwork of great value. They're further enriched with ornaments of gold intermixed with pearls, diamonds, rubies, emeralds, and other gems. In sheer contrast, chambers then presented scenes of the terrible, for example, trees torn to pieces by the violence of tempests, howling jackals, gibbets, apparatus of torture, poisonous wheeze, it goes on, the third scenes of the surprising were capable, according to Chambers, of exciting opposite and violent sensations, such as the traveler is surprised with repeated shocks of electrical impulse, with showers of artificial rain, or sudden violent gusts of wind, and instantaneous explosions of fire, the earth trembles under him, and his ears are successively struck with many different sounds, some resembling the cries of men in torment, others the, the roaring of bulls, and the howl of ferocious animals with the yell of hounds and the voices of hunters. And others imitate thunder, the raging of the sea, the explosion of cannon, the sound of trumpets, and all the noise of war. These scenes, as you may have guessed, were, of course, more from Chambers' imagination than a realistic account of the Chinese gardens. While the English readers were only half convinced by the fantastical images, what they could not forgive was that in contrast to his exaggerations of Chinese gardening, Chambers criticized the English, or the Brownian style, which the Whig writers celebrated as the, English, the image of English liberty, was monotonous, insipid, and demonstrated a status of languor of the mind. Rather than simply expressing his personal jealousy of Brown or asserting a Tory landscape as a superficial and a despotic indulgence, Chambers' juxtaposition of the two mental states associated with the English and the Chinese gardening deserves a more serious examination. This contrast in the two mental states he presented, languor and violent sensations, echoes the effect of the beautiful and the sublime described by Edmund Burke in his A Philosophical Inquiry, it's a long title, uh, in 1757, which Chambers had carefully studied and alluded to his earlier essay of the art of laying out gardens. Burke was a, stronger, a strong supporter of Chambers in the dissertation dispute, and even called himself a Chamberist. As Richard Burke has suggested, uh, Edmund Burke's inquiry uh, into the origins of the sublime, the beautiful, was an investigation into training imaginative sensibilities. Terms such as sensibility, imagination, and taste in 18th century Britain were political at the same time as they were psychological or moral. Both Whigs and Tories are eager to be seen as 
men of morals or virtues, which were considered to be the very protection of English liberty, and accused the other side of corruption. The English concept of virtue was inherited from the Roman virtues, which referred to martial values such as courage, self-restraint, and strength. The greatest enemy of virtues, as the Stoic philosopher Seneca held, was fortuna, for example, wealth or luxury. The Stoic's teaching was dear, was close to British hearts, as anxiety about the corruption of morals by commerce was constantly seen in different representations of the time. While traditional minds condemned commerce as sinful, Scottish Enlightenment thinkers, such as Adam Smith, considered commercial society as a final stage in the development of society, naturally succeeding that of agriculture. While he recognized that the aesthetic qualities of commodities satisfied the nicety and the delicacy of our taste, Adam Smith also noted that the emasculating effect of excessive luxury, commenting, quote, perhaps the delicate sensibility required in civilized nations sometimes destroys the masculine firmness of character. The refined material culture of commercial society, which enhanced the people's sensibilities to the pleasures of liberty and the commerce, also undermined martial values. To counteract the negative effect of commerce, Adam Smith and many other liberal thinkers suggested military strategies to revive the languishing martial spirits of Britons and the nation. Chambers of Scots descent emphasized the Scottish Enlightenment discourse, but as an architect, he took up a sensationalist approach and the following Burke's theory of the sublime, putting forward his own theory of molding citizens' martial virtues by landscape gardening and city landscaping, a theory which he disguised in the garb of Chinese gardens. In Burke's inquiry, the beautiful is associated with pleasures and the feminine, which arouse love and beauty and pity. Such passions, for Burke, relax the nerves and reduce the body to a state of languor that in its most extreme form can lead to self-destruction. The sublime associated with the terrible, the supernatural, and the powerful stimulates the strongest passion that we are capable of feeling. The sublime is posited against the beautiful as an antidote against languor because it intensifies vitality by an acceleration of tension in the organism, keeping the organism in active, healthy condition. The sublime, therefore, has the effect of curing weakness. Congruent with Burke's theory of the beautiful and sublime, Chambers orchestrated the oriental scenes of luxury and surprising. Chinese gardens were an appropriate rhetorical model for several reasons. In the first place, for early modern Europeans, China was an oriental empire that had long achieved the material abundance and the civility to which European was then aspiring. The luxurious home and the polite goods shaped home by East India companies represented for Europeans as a whole new category of what Maxim Berg called an economy of quality and delight, and stimulated new ways of thinking about a more civilized way of life. So here, uh, the Chinese pavilion at the Jottingham Palace uh, may be an apt example. But the Europeans were also conscious of the corrupting effect of oriental luxury, which they believed to have led to Chinese effeminacy, which subsequently resulted in the Han Chinese being conquered by the Manchus in the mid-17th century. 
Chambers' oriental scenes of the pleasing, with their allusions to British urban commercial exuberance from colonial trade, therefore captured the British、um, imperial anxieties about becoming a commercial society and eventually falling, as both the Roman and the Chinese empires had done. In another light, Chambers was also familiar with the Jesuit. Per- Missionaries and Enlightenment philosophies, image of the just and the temperate morality which they thought Confucianism brought to Chinese art of government. Interpreting from the Jesuits' accounts, Chambers commented, "The Chinese gardeners were not only botanists but painters and philosophers, having a thorough knowledge of the human mind and of the arts by which its strongest feelings are excited." This insight may be a deeper reason for him to employ the Chinese gardens as a disguise of his own theory, which sought to shape British citizens' minds through landscape gardening. Finally, through his study of popular Jesuit accounts of the Manchu Qing Empire, Chambers had learned about the annual military exercises organized by the Manchu emperors at Mulan, a vast area. With mountains and the forests in today's Inner Mongolia, holding a similar concern as the Europeans about being corrupted by the affluent Han Chinese style lifestyle, the Manchu emperors adopted annual hunting as their strategy for preserving their military rigor, while maintaining Confucian morals as the foundation of their government. The aforementioned scenes of the surprising in Chambers' dissertation sh- showed parallels with Jesuit missionaries' accounts of the Qing military exercises. Chambers would have in mind the discourse at home regarding using military exercises or militias to strengthen martial virtues to counteract the emasculating effect of commercial society. Adam Ferguson, the Scottish philosopher, suggests that the task for the governing class was to find a way to mix the military spirit with our civil and commercial policy. In agreement with Ferguson, Chambers also wrote to one of his critics, "Quote: Our gardeners, and I fear our connoisseurs too, are such tame animals that much much sparring is necessary to keep." Uh, to keep them properly on their haunches. To illustrate Chambers' method of u- using a scenic diet to shape the virtues of British citizens, let's see, consider the drawing of a view of the menagerie and its pavilion in Chambers' um, plans for the Kew Gardens. The delicate and exotic Chinese pavilion. The pond of goldfish and the runways of cages for Chinese pheasants anticipated the summer scenes of luxury in the dissertation nine years later. In contrast to the fragility and、uh, femininity of luxury in the desert,、um, sorry, of the wood structure to the left is the sturdiness of a stone building, the Temple of Bellona. The ancient Roman goddess of war, dedicated to those who served in the Seven Years' War. Therefore, the sublime of the Bellicose goddess, the associations with military rigor, would be evoked in the visitor's mind, counteracting the softening effect of Oriental luxury. A quick word of conclusion. In Chambers' dissertation, among the often confusing images of the Chinese garden, a masculine Manchurian empire and an effeminate,、uh, civilized Oriental civilization entangled with European traditions of shaping the virtues, are found encoded British statesmen's imaginings of an empire regenerated in the age of commercialization. Exploiting the double meaning model, <coughs> Chambers envisioned British landscape gardens and, by extension, cities, as sites of not only burgeoning commerce and refined taste, but also of pseudo military training. Applying the Burkean sublime effect to the design and the construction of British cities, Chambers' so-called Chinese gardening. 
would ensure the British Empire's stability and global dominance, not only in terms of economic development, but also of strengthening its military might and ethos. Thank you. Thank you.